Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me today here to present our work. <clears throat> I'm a little bit sick actually, so my voice is not in, the, in, in, in this perfect condition, but I'll try my best. I have a glass of water on the side, so let's start. Uh, basically, I would like to start by saying the motivation of our work. Here we see the results of uh, the ISMRAM 2015 tractography challenge. We see the valid bundles and invalid bundles here. In this challenge, the contestants were given a synthetic uh, uh, brain image, which, were, which was composed of 25 uh, known uh, fiber bundles. Uh, but uh, many times they actually generated over 100, even in some cases over 100, uh, 220, uh, 200, uh, 250. So tractography is known actually to be uh, to, to have some limitations. And prior to this work, there was already uh, concerns about the limitations and the alarms coming. Basically, uh, the Thomas Thomas Eros work here uh, showed the limitations of tractography on the specificity sensitivity uh, axis. And when we go towards uh, one corner, we have the false positive which means that we are getting connections that actually do not exist. And on the other side, we have false negatives, which means we are missing actual connections. In 2018 tractography challenge again, there was tracer injection comparison <clears throat> against the tractography results. And we observed here that uh, in the macaque brain, these contestants mostly accumulated on this corner where we had uh, largely false negatives, which were also actually observed in our uh, on previous year uh, validation study as well that false negatives were an issue too. Uh, when we go back to ISM around 2015 challenge, if you look at the over bundle overlap and overreach, we actually also see lots of false negatives here. So we have two problems. When, when, when it comes to connectivity, there are actually lots large number of false positives. When it comes to bundle coverage, there are lots of false negatives. And false negatives, when uh, we look at tractograms with large number of false negatives, we fall into this side. And tractograms look very basically sparse streamlines and less, less coverage of the cortical side. But when we have the false, when we switch to the other side, false positives, we have better coverage, but then we have lots of zigzags and it can uh, end up in the uh, wrong side of, of the brain, for instance. And generally, we have probabilistic approaches on this corner and deterministic approaches on this corner. So we wanted to actually improve this and go towards this direction. And uh, tractography uh, challenges have been quite instrumental in developing and addressing the developing new efforts and addressing the limitations. And we try to participate and benchmark our uh, techniques in the previous challenges, actually since 2020 to 2017. And uh, each time there has been different team. And we ran quite good in every one of them. So the 2017 challenge was focusing on repeatability, and we ranked number two. 2018, there was a phantom challenge, and we won this one. In 2020, we had a tracer injection challenge. In that case, in the first round, in the DSI, DSI category, we were number three. And then in the second round, we were number two. And last year, in the connectome challenge, our pipeline actually ranked number one. But the most rewarding aspect of last year's challenge was the second and third ranking teams also use all al al algorithm. So we are happy that the, uh, our techniques have been getting more popular and they are, they are actually working quite well. Uh, I have to note that in the first tractography challenge that we participated, we used a friended series frame uh, approach. And I, I will come to explain this very soon. But in the letter two, we had the parallel transfer. There, there are differences. And I will uh, explain all these differences uh, in the coming slides. Uh, I would like to start by key observations that uh, have motivated the ideas behind our work. We looked at the brain basically, and we observe a large structural organization. These organizations basically uh, are uh, encountered in a lot, uh, many, uh, many, many connections, uh, many systems of the fi fiber systems in the brain. And uh, they are uh, basically make these structural connections uh, uh, very well organized and they uh, form topographic organization or regularity. And uh, this was first uh, the question of how uh, can we use this prior information to improve tractography was first asked by my uh, uh, postdoc supervisor, Professor Yongang Shi at 
University of Southern California in year 2015, if I remember correct. And based on this, we actually <clears throat> made some observation uh, to basically how to leverage this information. So we look at the, uh, the studies and dissection, basically studies and other papers about the topographic organization of the brain. Yong Gang was already making studies on this previously. And we observe basically that the visually connections look smooth. It, it means that they don't actually make the zigzags that we typically see in probabilistic tractography. That would actually be difficult to form a, a well-organized connections if you make zigzags. So uh, we, uh, we observe that the, they really need to be smooth. And we actually see in deterministic tractography that the connections look very smooth and that lead to very well-organized uh, overall tractograms. And the second observation is the connections not only are smooth, of course, overall, they keep their uh, order. I will come to these points uh, later, step by step, but we basically, in order to use this uh, info, prior information for tractography, we needed approaches to express them in mathematical way. So we start by looking at the smooth curve. So what's a smooth curve? Smooth curve, as we can, uh, as I demonstrate here, uh, tend, our curve square tangent is continuous throughout the evolution of the curve. So we see that there are no breaks here and the tangent as shown here is smoothly varying when the curve propagates. On the counterpart, of course, we can have curves where tangent is not uh, smooth, uh, tangent is not continuous. So in that case, we will have, uh, we will have curves that, that make zigzags like this where the tangent is not continuous. So we want the tangent to be continuous. So we have a mathematical way to express this. And we are fortunate because the differential geometry of curves is well studied since 1800s. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the fundamental ways is to use the Frenet survey frames. And I will, uh, for the rest of, for, for, for a while, I will actually go quite deep and give you a technical information about these frames and how they mean and why are they useful for tractography. So we start by uh, curve parameterization. So we have gamma t here. And in this case, as an example, is represented by t cubed, t square, and t. Each of these are actually showing the trajectory of motion and x, y, and z coordinates uh, separate. So we have t here at 0. And uh, when t varies in, in, along the curve, the curve also moves. So we can also have the derivative of this curve with respect to t. Here it is 3t cubed, 2t, and 1. And this is the basically the velocity. In physics, they are <clears throat> the magnitude of the velocity vector is called speed. And we can have a second derivative, which is acceleration and third density. So two independent, uh, two, two French mathematicians independently discovered the Frenet Serre frame around the similar times. And the tangent basically is the direction of the velocity vector, the unit vector is expressed here. We have the normal vector, which is the derivative of the tangent. So how, how fast the tangent varies, basically how the tangent varies itself. And uh, the normal brings a parameter called curvature. Basically, uh, I will come to explain uh, how they actually move together, but I'd like to give you the mathematical insight first. And uh, the binormal is the cross product of this tangent and the normal, and binormal is tied with the torsion parameter. Um, <clears throat> when we evaluate all these expressions, we can actually represent uh, the tangent, normal, binormal here on the curve. We can calculate them. So tangent here is the red, red arrow, and normal is the green, and the blue one is the binormal. And we can calculate it anywhere on the curve and it will make this nice smooth motion. Um, one, in, one important point of Frenet survey frame is that actually everything is local. That means while we see this smooth motion here, it actually is completely uh, dependent on the local parameterization. Uh, what I mean by is with this is we can calculate, for example, when t is 0 0.5, we can calculate the point where it is in space, all its derivatives, we can calculate tangent, normal, binormal, curvature, and torsion. The reason I'm telling this is this will become important in a minute for tractography. But uh, I would like to highlight that uh, it's uh, a local 
tick and it's unique. Once you have a curve parameterization, the frame is, uh, frame is unique. But the issue is that uh, uh, when the curvature is zero, we have a problem. And this is the case when we have straight lines. So a straight line in this example is given here, 2 t t 0 and we can have the derivative of this, which will be two, one, zero, and the second derivative will vanish. And this will make the second derivative here zero, curvature will be zero, and the normal will have zero in the denominator. So you won't have a normal, then you won't have binormal, and you don't have torsion. So these are undefined. So the frame at, uh, this, this uh, frame series frame doesn't allow you to have curvature of zero. It is undefined, it's degenerate. We cannot use it. Uh, if everything is local, where does the moving frame come from? Because when we collect all these expressions together, uh, we actually can have a differential uh, system of differential equations. And this will basically tie the derivative of uh, the frame and the, uh, the curve evolution with, with the points on the curve and the frame itself, together with curvature and torsion. And we know that if we, if we have the initial condition set, given curvature and torsion, we can solve this. It means basically uh, with given initial conditions, the evolution of the curve only depends on curvature and torsion. And this is actually known as the fundamental, fundamental theorem of curves. Uh, for the sake of completeness, I will basically flash the solution of this. It's very ugly, uh, but for those who want to watch the presentation later, maybe find this useful. The whole solution actually is given in our paper. Uh, uh, as I said, it looks complicated, but I'm not going to explain it. You, you should have a look at the paper for the details. But overall, the solution will boil down to this kind of expression. We will have the initial uh, conditions here, and we will have a propagator matrix. And this will be similar to this a four by four matrix. And then when you multiply this matrix with the initial condition, you will have the state at the, at the next condition. And in this case, that depends on delta t, which is a step size, and there's a parameter in this propagator. So we can use this to, to move along a curve. In this case, we start with gamma zero, and we have a given uh, frame. If we select some uh, curvature and torsion value, we can calculate the propagator for a given step size, and then we can move on the next state. So now we have this, and we can select a different curvature and torsion, and we can calculate this propagator matrix and move to another uh, point, and we iterate this to propagate. But this will be uh, the one of the technical points that we will leverage for track algorithm. But let's have a look at how what this curvature and torsion mean. Uh, I will show some videos for a step size of 0 0.1 and a curvature and, and different curvature and torsion values. And for 100 steps, I will iterate. So here the curvature is set to 0 0.5 and torsion is 0. We see that the curvature of 0 0.5 basically bends the curve towards the direction of the normal vector. That's the effect of curvature. And we can set it to negative 0 0.5. In this case, the curve, uh, the curve bends against the, on the opposite direction of the normal vector. I'd like to introduce another concept here, which is called the radius of curvature. And it's defined as one over the curvature. This basically gives you a physical idea of the radius of this uh, uh, loop. And it will be, in this case, one over 0 0.5, two. So the radius here is actually two. We can also set the torsion to some value. And torsion here is a positive value. And a positive torsion basically will bend the curve on the direction of the, on the binormal, uh, binormal vector. And um, a negative torsion will bend the curve on the opposite direction of the binormal. And of course, we can vary them simultaneously to generate uh, different shapes of uh, di various different smooth curves. But I would like to highlight at this point that uh, curvature and torsion are intertwined in a frame area frame. That means, uh, <clears throat> okay, let's have a look at how this curve evolves. That means torsion is not very meaningful when curvature is very small, actually. And uh, for example, in here, we have a curvature and torsion 
uh, weaving together nicely. Uh, they are both having non-zero values, but uh, now when we have a curvature which is very small, even when we have torsion, uh, there's no bending towards the direction of the binormal. That effect is basically gone because of the low curvature value. But uh, zero torsion is meaningful. Uh, with zero torsion, uh, when you have a curvature, the curve ba basically bend on the same plane, so it doesn't change the plane. Uh, overall, uh, the frame and frame provides a very nice framework, actually, when you understand the mechanics of it uh, to, to model the smooth curves. And the next next our question, is this the right uh, way to do tractography? Can we use it for tractography? Would it work? Would it uh, leverage the things that we wanted to leverage? Actually, we tried this and we implemented it in our MICI paper in 2016. Here is an FOD field, and here we start by a random point in the in the brain, and we estimate tangent normal by normal at the initial point, and we guess the curvature and torsion at this initial point. And now we can set a step size, complete that propagator I mentioned to, and then we can move to the next point, and then we just now move it, and then we have the now the next point and the frame. We guess the next curvature and tor torsion move to the next point and iterate it until we complete the streamline. But uh, now I come back to the point that it's all local with the frame a serial frame. It means that it means that we have to be correct at each point. The solution is unique. So that is a limitation in the sense that we really need to be good in the estimation of frame at each step. Secondly, we have a problem with straight lines because if we have the curvature zero, there is no frame. So uh, the proper initialization at straight line segments uh, or close to straight line segments, which is quite common in the brain, becomes highly problematic. Overall, uh, while using frame a serial frame is possible, fiber tracking with only varying the curvature and torsion using this fundamental theorem of curves is not possible. So we actually had to estimate the frame itself uh, at every step. It means, uh, it means that we rotated in three dimensions, these three orthonormal vectors, first in the direct, in the axis of the tangent, and then the normal, and then the binormal. And this allowed us uh, basically to estimate the frame more accurately at each step. It also increased the parameter step to five, which is quite heavy. And um, it was quite demanding and slow uh, tracker. On the other hand, we get very promising results. So for example, here's a visualization of a uh, uh, fiber cut results that we obtained with the a serial based tractography algorithm. And we see from here that I have 4D1 to the probabilistic algorithms have challenges uh, passing through crossing regions. If they pass, they, they make a lot of zigzags, losing topographic organization of the fibers where the ground truth is uh, perfectly organized. Uh, we were able to actually cross nicely and also preserve the organization of the streamlines that is similar to the deterministic approach. Uh, here is the visualization uh, uh, of optical radiation that we obtained using HCP data. We again observe similar features that uh, we were able to preserve the topographic organization very well, similar to the deterministic technique, while at the same time we were able to capture the challenging Myers loop which is not very good with deterministic approaches, but somewhat possible with probabilistic approaches, which lose the topographic organization. So uh, the next question was, because the frame area approach was very complicated technically and has challenges. Uh, the question is, uh, is there only one way to frame a curve? And to our luck, uh, to our help, uh, uh, Richard Bishop came with his 1975 paper. And there is more than one way to frame a curve. That's the title of the paper. And uh, Professor Bishop actually uh, had a start with a idea saying that, okay, we take a curve. And if you imagine in your mind that you can actually think of these parallel curves, which means that by design, you actually picture these curves to have shared the same tangent with this initial curve that you start. And any of these curves you can pick, and in this case, I pick this one, 
and we can basically parameterize it by this gamma t plus m1 vector, which is separated in the initialization. And uh, we can actually write this m1 vector uh, with the distance from the initial point r times this k1, which is the unit vector in the direction of m1. And we can pick a second curve, the parallel one. In that case, we'll pick it so that these are 90 degrees apart. And this is the m2. And here, r again is the distance. We pick the same with the same distance. And k2 will be the unit vector in the direction of m2. And by definition, these all curves, m curves, share the same tangent. So we, we can express it like this. And this will lead to the, the, the expression that the derivative of these k vectors will be actually in the direction of tangent. Now we write this k1 vector in terms of uh, the sine and cosine sum, summation of this normal and binomial vectors. We do the same for k2. And we can actually represent now the normal vector in terms of k1 and k2. And now we can pull the derivative of tangent because we have the frame area frame here. We know that it's curvature times normal. And we can express the tangent, the derivative of tangent in terms of k1 and k2. We can also express the derivative of k1 in terms of tangent. So I will skip a few steps here, but the derivative of k1 gives this expression. And by definition, we know that it should be in the direction of tangent because we pick it to be a parallel curve. This means that this term needs to go to zero. And this gives an equivalence relation with torsion, that the torsion is equal to the derivative of this angle that we initially picked, which can be any angle. And this, uh, the derivative of k2 can also be written and it has the same uh, cancellation occurring here. Uh, with this derivative of tangent and derivative of k1, we have uh, common expressions that we in term with name as the small k1, which is a scalar. And with the k2, we have the, another term, which we call it k2. And overall, when we collect them together, we will have actually an expression of curvature as well here, which will be the square root of the squares of this small k1 and k2. And we will have a new system of differential equations. The reason I explain this in this uh, depth is because uh, you will have problem understanding uh, Professor Bishop's paper, and uh, uh, the the there isn't actually material in the internet that explains this clearly. So I thought this would, uh, since it's also recorded, would be helpful for others to understand parallel transport frame as well. And uh, the name, however, comes from Hansen and Ma. Ma. Uh, they actually take this approach and they argued that the parallel transport frame uh, that they determined is quite useful. Mm -hmm. Professor Bishop actually uh, argued that Frenet Serre will be the dominant way, but uh, these authors here argued that the parallel transport frame has quite unique advantages over it and can, can have very practical advantages. Uh, for example, they they uh, they published actually a method to, for streamline visualization, so it really fits well for tractography, as I as I will explain momentarily. And one other thing uh, with these authors were they were from Indian University Bloomington, home of Taipei. So when we solve this, we again have a similar expression in in terms of form. That means we will have we will have a propagator, which will this time depend on small k1 and k2. And we can basically iterate the same way as I've mentioned for the frame and area frame. But let's have a look at how they vary along, along t. So when we have positive k1, the curve will bend in the direction of this k1 axis, which is the green one here. And we have a, when we have a negative uh, k1, the curve will bend on the other opposite uh, direction of the k1 axis. So we will have the same relationship as curvature here. But the interesting thing comes when you combine with the k2, because k2 is not like curvature. You can actually have k2 even when k1 is 0, and vice versa. And k2 independently actually pulls the curve towards the direction of the k2 axis. So they both make arcs. 
So here is uh, in the when k2 is negative, then you actually may make the bet on the opposite direction of the k2 axis. So when we vary them simultaneously, we can again uh, represent the, the smooth curves. This time I also have this other uh, way, way of showing this. So I have this k1 axis here on in here and k2 axis here. So while I vary this this k1 and k2 together, I also show them on on the k1 k2 axis. And as you see, it it will uh, have no degeneracy. It can be very small curvature, one of them, both of them can be very close to zero and et cetera, no problem. Uh, but the interesting thing comes from uh, the, the fact that we can actually start with a different uh, frame and different K1, K2 and same the, have the same uh, curve parameterized. So this cannot be possible for Theranate serial frames because it's local and it's unique. So a parallel transport frame has this advantage that you can start with any random frame, but then you will need to adjust your K1 and K2 according to how you started. And in this case, I actually rotated the initial frame uh, by, by I think about the 30 degrees. And this actually means that I should rotate the K1, K2 also 30 degrees in here in the K1, K2 frame. Not possible with frame sorry. So this comes with some advantages for tractography. First of all, now it's not local. It depends on initialization. It means that we can initialize with any frame as long as the tangent is good. And we don't have straight line issue. As long as we get the tangent, it's fine. So it's well-defined and we just need to repeat the frame itself on straight lines. So proper initialization now is straight lines possible. Overall, uh, fiber tracking by only varying these K1 and K2 uh, values is possible. And we don't need to estimate the frame at each step. So it's it's quite useful for tractography. When we put put K1, the small K1 and K2 on a 2D, 2D axis, since we know that the curvature is the square root of some of the squares of these two, what we can do to generate curves, we can, for example, pick a step size and pick a random point in this K1, K2 axis. And every time we can pick a different uh, pair here and then add on, on top of where we were left. So we, of course, the, basically we calculate the propagator at each step and multiply. So we have all the tangents at all the frame and et cetera. So in the current implementation, the K1 and K2 are not continuous. We do like this exactly. Uh, but tangent is continuous. So the curves are actually technically smooth in the C1 sense. And uh, actually in tracker version 0 0.7, we have implementation for even C2 continuous parallel transport tractography. That means the K1 and K2 are also continuous. But we did not observe a very big difference and it makes the computation quite complicated. So we will put it aside for now. So now I actually explained how we can use uh, parallel transport frames to basically mathematically express smooth curves. Next, I would like to show about how, how can we use it to keep the order of the connections. And we do it with probes. And probes are basically a set of curves. And in this case, for example, we are talking about a single curve and we set the length of this single curve to, to a certain value. And each of these uh, points here basically correspond to, 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 uh, to an arc, as I showed here. So we will use this for tractography in a moment. But parallel transport frame actually allows much more than, than this. For example, we can easily create tubes just by simply picking the right K1, K2 pair depending on where we start. So <clears throat> this can be used as a probe. And uh, we, are, we have already implemented this in our tracker software. But we can also use, uh, we can also use sheets, for example, uh, which we have not used. But uh, it's possible. And it's quite simple to implement these also. And we can uh, also use fanning sheets. Uh, so we just need to vary the K1 and K2 in various different ways. However, we like these are quite simple to implement. 
and we can go even fancier. We can do a uh, 3D object of varying bending and fanning curves, whatever we, we want. So it provides very uh, interesting options for designing probes, but we have not actually worked with those yet, maybe in the future. So uh, how we do tractography is that we basically uh, put these probes in the FOD field and measure how much they are supported by the data. At the initialization, we basically try with a number of probes and then we find a good fit. And then we take a step of whichever value we, we desire. And then we move to that point and then look for this time with different K1, K2 parameters. Uh, to, we also discretize this uh, probes so that actually we don't uh, have, a, we have only a few numbers of points and tangents computed along the probe. And uh, I can maybe express it a bit more technically so that if, if this field shown here is represented by D, uh, P, V, which is the FOD field. So every point we have an FOD here. And uh, we have a probe here, which is represented by this omega K1, K2. And we basically, in this case, for example, can consider a tube. And we have samples of points along the tube. And these samples are basically are points, a member of the probe. And we compute the tangents using the propagator I mentioned to you about. So the probe parameters include the minimum radius of curvature, uh, the, the probe radius here presented by R, the length of the probe, probe count, which is basically the, 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 the number of uh, streamlines that we would like to simulate here. In this case, it is four, for example, one, two, three, four. And the probe quality is the number of divisions that we have. Here we have, as you see, one, two, three divisions. And we can also, we also have tracking parameters, which is the step size. And we have a data support threshold, which we call the mean FODM. And these jargon are all in actually in tracker terms. And the data support, uh, can, we can express as a function F of small k1 and k2 because we need to pick basically a k1 and k2 at each step and uh, we can ex we express it as an integral of fod contributions which basically here means that the sum of all fod con fod values along the direction of tangents for each of these points it's actually quite simple but we get the average so this symbol means the number of points so if in this case there are 16 points we call we add all the FOD contributions and divide by 16. If we do this for a large number of uh, points, let's, several thousand, let's say, we will get something like this, but we don't do it for track, fiber tracking sense. But we could have, if we did it, for example, the problem would be which one to pick. So if, for example, we uh, pick the peak point by some, let's say, optimization approach, uh, then it would be a deterministic parallel transport tractor, which we actually don't do. We instead do a sampling and we have a probabilistic approach. And for the sampling, we consider this function as a probability density function and draw samples proportional to the value of F. So it means we actually draw more samples or it's more likely to pick a sample if F is high and it's less likely to be picked if F is low and we do it with the rejection sample. So let's have a look at some of the results that we obtained. So here's some visual visualizations uh, using HCP data. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the result looks very, very organized with parallel transport technique, uh, similar to the deterministic approach. On the other hand, the, it has the coverage of the brain similar to the probabilistic approaches. So we, we, we are able to get uh, what we what we wanted from the beginning, and this is valid uh, pretty much for all the all over the brain. Here is the result that we obtained for the ISMRM 2015 challenge. Again, visual inspection. We have the ground truth here, and we have the PTT results. And again, we see very nicely organized fiber bundles resembling the ground truth itself. And here's CST and Terry Commissioner. You can see the organization uh, is preserved quite well. Some quantitative results 
from the ISM around 2015 challenge. Here, uh, we actually reported pretty much everything possible um, when it comes to quantitative evaluation of tractography results. And for that, we actually varied, uh, uh, we perturbed the parameter space. We started with default values, we represented by a red cross here, which, uh, uh, which are shown like this. And we varied uh, the data support, uh, minimum data support, minimum FODM here, which is represented with F min here. So various values for that. And the uh, step size, probe length, probe radius were also varied. Overall, we have quite competitive results for invalid connection percentage and valid, valid connection percentage here. Also, bundle detection is quite average. It's, it's not uh, very bad. It's, it's not phenomenally good at all either. So it's just competitive in this. But bundle volume, and when you look at the, the bundle overlap, bundle overreach axis, which is quite uh, comparable with the, uh, the specificity sensitivity, actually, is uh, quite interesting because we were able to push it uh, towards this, this corner. And you can see that uh, there was no there was no uh, there was no submission on the original on the original challenge that were getting let's say 40, almost like forty percent uh, post negatives here uh, while reaching a reaching the thirty percent false positives. So it, it is quite uh, it's quite competitive in that sense. And we also tested the uh, performance on topographic organization because uh, that's something we would like to study more with this approach. We, we are looking at, uh, in this case, the visual field and optic track. So what we have is eccentricity here. And here, the blue region shows the central vision and the, the red goes basically our peripheral, peripheral vision. And we know that there is a mapping, a functional mapping of this on the back of the head. So basically the central vision maps on the and the back of the brain, the more posterior parts, but the lateral vision goes towards more anteriorly. So what we did here in the study was to map this, uh, uh, the mapping also on the streamlines. So here, basically, the colors map the, the location, of the, the basic eccentricity value, basically where your field of view is on the track program. And the purple area is LGN, so the connection between LGN and the V1. So we see actually the, the representation, also the U-shaped representation is also preserved in the sense that there's a U-shaped representation in the cortex, there's a U-shaped representation in the streamlines also, which is quite interesting to see that uh, is also present. There are also studies actually showing the organization going deep in the LGN also, not with tractography, but there are studies showing the topographic organization as such. Uh, here are how FOD1, IFOD2, and the ST stream approaches uh, compare against train SRA tractography. So we can see that uh, the, the cross sections actually, uh, in many cases, are very well organized for the train SRA, but in some cases, these approaches are actually mixing the colors together. So we actually suggested that uh, if we if we would like to measure how well they measure, they, they preserve the topographic regularity, we can look at how uh, actually a curve fits in this in this U-shaped behavior. And uh, the fit uh, can be measured by mean squared error and this R squared measures. And we evaluated them, I suppose, for 56 subjects here. And when we plot them, we observe that uh, the Frenet survey and PTT later on, we have we evaluated with PTT as well, performed very good. And PTT in particular performed the best, and Frene Serre performed also second best. And most recently, we have been working with the real time tractography. So we, 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 we wanted to actually use this for, uh, for real time applications, then we developed them. We developed a graphical user interface also. You can uh, try, download, and compile it for yourself. So the link is here. And uh, this allows you to, uh, to, to, in real time, do tractography. You can uh, change the parameters in real time, just uh, with sliders, knobs, and you can rotate, browse, uh, and peel through the brain and observe the connections yourself for either educative purposes or you can do some planning if you wish for your application. 
We also have a mechanism to visualize uncertainty. We basically sweep through the, the data support term. So this uh, the mean FOD AMP term, we are basically sweeping at 10 stages so that uh, we know that low values map to more, uh, uh, will, will, will basically decrease the false negative. So it's possible to visualize them with transparency also. And uh, one of the applications that we have been using this was uh, have been for the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation neural navigation. Here we see an operator holding a coil, um, and we have a volunteer here. The transcranial TMS coil is basically moving on top of the head, and we are using a neural navigation system that registers the position of the coil with the subject's head, and we can actually. Uh, the pinpoint where the a seed point on the brain, where the TMS will affect. And from the seed point in real time, we can generate streamlines so that the operator would be informed about which part of the brain uh, uh, is being stimulated or which connections are being stimulated. So some discussion points. Uh, PTT is a propagator-based tractography algorithm. So it solved the local problem in that way. But for quantitative, so for example, for connectomics, there is need to use uh, additional approaches uh, for, for, for example, commit shift life are necessary to, to be used for connectomics applications. And uh, the use of frame and serial frame for tractography is old. Uh, it has been actually mentioned from the very first paper, papers of Peter Basser in 2000 but it hasn't been used to parameterize and technically basically meant for tractography to generate smooth curves as we do. And approaches leveraging differential geometry of curves with neighboring data have also been proposed. So these are uh, in that way, that's also not new. Uh, uh, Savadiev's paper actually used helixes to do similar things, but it actually, uh, it, uh, it, it didn't, uh, Obviously, it didn't have, for example, the probes and etc. like we have. So, but the, the second order approaches have mostly been popularized by IFOD2 method of uh, the, the Turniers, uh, Turniers method that was implemented in, it's implemented in MR3 now. And uh, it's, it has a lot of similarities with PTT when used with a single curve, a probe. And uh, I would like to just point out this because people have been asking me this question. So one, one difference is the step size and probe length. In IO4D2, they are coupled. So basically you cannot, the step size is probe length and uh, they, they have an internal mechanism to control uh, uh, the step size internally. So it is, it's difficult, uh, it is possible to actually uh, uh, the tune it as a parameter to to make the, that internal step size smaller and et cetera. But uh, it's, it's still not customized. We, are, we have complete decoupling of this. So we can set the step size independent of the problem. And the data support is com complicated, uh, computed differently. There is a multiplication in IFOD2. In our case, we have addition. The sampling part is also a little bit different. IFOD2 has a custom uh, I may be wrong with it, but custom rejection sampling based approach, uh, uh, which depends on some form of calibration. Uh, unfortunately, this is not very well documented, but uh, they are also aware of this. And they, I think they are working on documentation or at least they have been thinking about <laughs> documenting and it would be very useful for the community to know, but they have a, a little bit different rejection sampling than the the rejection sampling we have in the we use a very simple rejection sampling approach based on the maximum value of the data support. And uh, the main difference uh, is the probe options, which IFOD2 does not have, but we enable probe options with uh, PTT. To conclude, uh, we basically design the parallel transport tractography to generate some curves, and we provide probe options in and uh, we are still at the beginning of this exploring the possible probe options that we can uh, do with parallel transport tractography. 
But uh, these provide a powerful tool to study brain connections, in particular for topographic organization. And uh, PTT is well documented. It has open source code tracker that you can, you can uh, use yourself also to, uh, to test it out. It's benchmarked in several international competitions with very good rankings. And uh, we are actually now uh, implementing it in DIPI also. So that will be opportunity for in interested researchers to, to contribute to develop this, uh, uh, develop, develop PTT in the future as well. So with that, I'll finalize my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer your questions.